Hello. This is the sixth episode of The Bible and You, a program focused on the study of God's holy word without any preconceived dogma or denominational doctrine. Today's episode is entitled The Nephilim, Part 2, and is part of the series on the multiple creations of God. Having dealt with the first three creations in prior episodes, that is, the first creation when God the Father created the morning star Jesus, the second creation when Jesus created Lucifer and all the rest of the heavenly beings, the third creation when Jesus created the physical universe, including the earth and the Nephilim angels, we're now examining the fourth creation when Jesus restored the earth and replaced its original inhabitants with mankind. This fourth creation is the one that is described in the book of Genesis. I refer to it as the six-day creation. The fourth creation may be called the age of man, because man was created during this age, and was the most important part of it. But as I told you last time, man was not the only intelligent being on the earth at the time. The Nephilim angels, who were created as the premier beings of the third creation, were allowed to carry over into the fourth creation and live on the earth. But they were supposed to stay in their land, called Nod, while man was to stay in his land, called Eden. But thanks to Satan's efforts, it didn't work out that way. The Nephilim angels left their land, impregnated human females, and thus created a mongrel race, often referred to as Nephilim giants. If this is a mystery to you, please go back and listen to episode 5 of The Bible and You. I think that will clear it up. In that episode, I said that the Nephilim angels comprised a mortal or earthly body, but had immortal life. I further stated that as a result of their sinful mixing with humans, they were sent to Tartarus. And I quoted the following scripture as partial proof. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. That's 2 Peter 2.4. I assured you that they were in chains to this very day, and therefore could not repeat their sin of physically molesting mankind. I stand by all that, but I do owe you an explanation of how that's possible. In order to understand this, we must first understand the heavens. I believe there are three heavens spoken of in the Bible. The first heaven is the atmosphere of the earth, where the birds fly. This heaven is sometimes accurately spoken of in the Bible as the air, as in Ephesians 2.2, when Satan is described as the prince of the power of the air. The second heaven is what many of us refer to as outer space. That is the entire universe outside the earth's atmosphere. And the third heaven is the heaven of God, the Father. There's a good reference to both the second and the third heavens in Second Chronicles 2.6, as Solomon considers the challenge of building a temple for the Almighty. He says, and I quote, But who is able to build him an house, seeing that the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain him? Here Solomon points out that God is bigger than both the physical universe, the second heaven, and even his own abode, the third heaven. Another common logistical mistake compounds the difficulty of correctly placing Satan and the fallen angels. We tend to think of Tartarus, that is the deepest abyss of Hades, as being somewhere under the surface of the earth, a hole in the ground. I believe that Tartarus is located somewhere in the second heaven. I don't know where, but it's out there somewhere in space. It's certainly not below the surface of the earth. I'll have much more to say about the abyss, Tartarus, in later episodes. There were two similar strange occurrences told of in chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Job, which seem to show that these fallen angels were not bound, were not confined. I quote, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. That's Job 1, 6. The two mistakes we might make when reading this scripture are, first, that this was a gathering of the holy angels, and second, that the gathering was in the third heaven of God. But 
Such a gathering would have been unnecessary. Why would God call the heavenly angels before him when Jesus said of them, they, quote, do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven? Matthew 18.10 And this gathering was not held in the third heaven of God. It was held in Tartarus, where the Nephilim were cast from the earth. It was the same sons of God who in the past left their own habitation and had sexual relations with women. It was there in their prison that they were called to give an accounting, along with their master, Satan. The Lord here, who spoke to Satan, was not God the Father, but the Word, because He is always the divine spokesman. He is always the intermediary. We know that fallen man may not come in direct contact with the Father while man is still in the flesh, so we can be sure that Satan and the fallen angels would never be tolerated in the presence of God the Father. The divine sentence against these rebellious angels and Satan was that they be reserved in Tartarus in chains of darkness until their judgment day. In spite of this, we are confronted with two conditions which seem to violate this sentence. First, the subject of this gathering concerns their whereabouts, as is evident by the question put to Satan. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? That's in Job 1.7. If it is impossible to escape Tartarus, why was this accounting necessary? Second, without any evident fear of criticism, Satan admits to having been on the earth again. And I quote, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Job 1.7 But this answer brings no surprise or anger from the Lord that they have not remained in prison until their judgment. We must admit that their being on earth in some form is allowed by God. How can that be? Satan is a heavenly being, and so had a celestial body. The Nephilim angels were from an earthly creation, the third, and so had earthly or terrestrial bodies. Remember that they physically were present when they roamed the land of Nod, crossed into Eden, and bodily violated the daughters of men. The answer, of course, that today the access that Satan and the fallen angels have to earth is limited to spiritual access. Physically, they are confined to Tartarus, but spiritually they are free to roam the earth, and roam they do. Keep in mind that only Satan was cast down from the paradise of God. As Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Luke 10:18. It was much later that the rebellious angels were cast down to Tartarus from their habitation on the earth. From the dark domain of Tartarus, their spirits are able to cross over to the earth, and we know these evil spirits as demons. The gatherings described in Job were to ensure that Satan and his demons were never on earth in body, but in spirit form only. The Lord regularly makes sure that they do not come to earth in their flesh. Peter confirms that Satan and his angels roam our earth when he writes, Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. That's 1 Peter 5.8. Certainly it is Satan and his angels who are the rulers of the darkness of this world, but there is a very real limit to their power. They may affect us only through spiritual wickedness, not in bodily form, but only as evil spirits. Just as God uses his holy angels to serve his purposes on earth, not as physical beings, but as spirits, as we're told in Psalm 104, verse 4, Satan uses his Nephilim angels as evil spirits. In Genesis 6, verse 17, God said, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. We may be certain that God accomplished this threat. Even Satan himself must have been affected, or even though he was from a creation from before the earth, he had a celestial body. The Nephilim were an earthly creation, and so had terrestrial bodies. I take God at his word and conclude here that Satan's body was affected when all flesh was destroyed, as was man's, the Nephilim angels, and their mixed offspring. However, the word destroy here should be applied with the understanding that 
until the very end of this age, all flesh is recoverable. We know that in time, both the flesh of the just and the unjust will be resurrected. The destroy used here signifies not annihilation, but a separation. In Hebrew, it means to decay, batter, cast off, corrupt, lose, mar, or spill. Destroy in Genesis 6.17 is different from the destroy Christ used to describe the annihilation of both body and soul in hell. That's in Matthew 10.28, which in the Greek means to destroy fully, perish, to lose. Job was aware that his death would not be the annihilation of his body, but only a temporary separation from its life when he said, Though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. That's Job 19.26. The death of the body is brought about by the simple procedure of separating it from its spirit or life. For as the body without the spirit is dead, that's in James 2.26, the body without the spirit is dead. Satan lost his original body and has operated in the spirit since his fall, as demonstrated by his having to possess the body of a serpent when he appeared to Eve. We should see that this separation is God's way of partially disarming these beings by not allowing them the use of their bodies. You might ask, for what possible reason is even their spiritual presence allowed on earth? Why doesn't God keep them completely away from us? This can be explained by two facts. First, to a degree, Satan has a legitimate claim to try to recruit mortal man. And second, man has a right to choose whom he will serve. If man had nothing to choose from, or if God made that choice for him, then there would be no real choice. Man is sought by both God and the devil. God calls men by his spirit and by his love, while Satan lures mortals by appealing to their baser desires. After Adam and Eve were ejected from the protection of the Garden of Eden, Satan had his angels use physical force to try to corrupt them. Now, without their physical bodies, the forces of evil are able only to corrupt men by spiritual means. Although Satan's spirit has full range on man's earth, he may possess only those who choose him above God. We shouldn't think that God forbids Satan access to any mortals. Satan was twice allowed to offer himself to God's servant Job, but only as a choice. And later Satan would offer Jesus, while Jesus was in human flesh, this same choice three times, a privilege of choice which is granted to every mortal. As Joshua told the people of Israel, and I quote, If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. That's Joshua 24:21, And again by Elijah, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. 1 Kings 18:21. The fact is that even today we are free to choose, and many humans fall for the tricks of Satan and fail to make the right choice. Only when the kingdom of Christ comes will Isaiah's prophecy be fulfilled. This is from Isaiah 32:18. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Only then will men be free from the influence of Satan and his demons. But you may have noticed that there is a group that I have not accounted for. What about the offspring of the Nephilim angels and humans, those mixed species individuals referred to as giants and men of renown? We know, of course, they were drowned in the great flood of Noah's day, and their bodies were destroyed. But what about their spirits? After all, they were descended in part from beings with eternal life, the Nephilim, and in part from man who had temporary life. And the statement, I will destroy all flesh, while it must have included the Nephilim angels, was especially directed to their partially human offspring. After all, God's purpose in sending the great flood was to prevent the complete corruption of the human race, and separating those mixed beings from their bodies effectively denied them that ability. I believe their flesh remains imprisoned in some form in the chains of death's darkness until their resurrection and judgment. This situation is similar to other beings, both good and bad, who underwent this separation of body and spirit, and whose bodies await being quickened and resurrected and then judged. 
and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's Daniel 12.2. While both the Nephilim angels and their offspring were separated from their bodies, it is only the eternal spirits of the Nephilim who became demons or evil spirits, and who began spiritually visiting our earth after the flood. I do not believe the spirits of the offspring became demons. After all, they were called men by the scriptures. That's in Genesis 6-4. It would be convenient to ignore the fate of these mixed beings. But we shouldn't allow the fate of any beings to be lost forever in the past. So what of those children which were born to the daughters of men and the sons of God? The answer to this question is not necessary to our own redemption, but by understanding it, we better appreciate the completeness of Christ's plan of redemption, which is to cover all sins by all beings. We saw in Cain's descendants that the Nephilim offspring were very intelligent. The Nephilim giants, being superior to humans in ability and numbers, were also greatly feared. In fact, the anarchy they caused made the earth a very forbidding place to live. Their being so renowned could be attributed to the violence they caused, perhaps in the same way in which the outlaws of our Old West were, and still are to a certain extent, held in awe. But with the children of the Nephilim, violence is attributed not to individuals, but to the entire race. In the scriptures, we have only one actual instance attributed to their violence, and I quote here from Genesis 4.23 in the American Standard Version, And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. On a side note, some writers have suggested that it was Cain that Lamech killed. That could not be, because this Lamech was not the Lamech who was Noah's father, but was a great-great-grandson of Cain. You can read about that in Genesis 4, verses 17 through 23. Because they were considered men and had terrestrial bodies, the bodies of the Nephilim giants drowned, but their spirits survived. Satan had intended to pass immortality to mortals through the Nephilim angels. And here we see that Satan is not omniscient. There are things he doesn't know because he made a mistake. He didn't realize that eternal life is not hereditary. It is the gift of God. The spirits of the Nephilim giants, like the spirits of all mortals who die, were recalled by their Creator. In a verse that I've previously read to you, we are told, The Spirit shall return to God who gave it. That's Ecclesiastes 12.7. More than any other, the Apostle Peter spoke of the things from that distant age. It is he who tells us much about spiritual things as well. He mentions the Holy Spirit's involvement in raising Christ from the dead. In 1 Peter 3.18 we read, Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. He also tells us of another incident involving spirits. And I quote from 1 Peter, parts of verses 19 and 20 from chapter 3. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. And when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing. Who were these spirits in prison? There's no mystery as to who was on the earth during the 120 years while Noah and his sons were building the ark. It certainly included those who God referred to when he said, quote, The earth is filled with violence through them. That's Genesis 6.13. The them is none other than the incredible children born as a result of the sons of God having intercourse with the daughters of men. The Nephilim offspring cannot be held accountable for being a mixed species, since that transgression was not theirs, it was their parents. However, the violent acts were of their own choosing. The uniqueness of the age in which they sinned should also be taken into account because they lived before the law was given. How does it work if, quote, the strength of sin is the law? That's 1 Corinthians 15:56. when there is no law. The scriptures are explicit that, quote, where no law is, there is no transgression. Romans 4:15. Clearly, the divine law existed even before it was given to mortals. 
For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. That's Romans 5.13. We know that sin was in God's creation even before there was a man, because Satan was guilty. So the violent acts of the Nephilim giants cannot be blamed on the absence of the law, yet they perished in the flood. Why did they perish if what they did was not held as a transgression? Here's the answer to that question. Whether there is law or there is no law, sin is the killer of life. I quote from Romans 2.12, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. Even though the law was yet to be given, the sinful state of the Nephilim giants was beyond redemption. After all, the law was given to prevent sin, not to redeem man's sins. Then we might say with Paul, Why doth he, that is God, yet find fault? Romans 9.19 For these perished without law, that is, their bodies perished in the flood. But there is no injustice here, because their spirits did not perish, and will be dealt with by a special provision, the same provision that is made for all those who died before the law was given. The loss of the bodies of the Nephilim giants in the waters of the flood was not the judgment of their souls any more than our physical death is our final judgment. Logic tells us that a just God does not hold any man accountable without a choice or a chance. And the fact that their spirits were later preached to confirms that they were indeed given this choice. Peter tells us the answer as to why these spirits were preached to. This is from 1 Peter 4, 6. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. To clarify, I believe that the gospel was preached to these mixed beings that died in the flood in order that they can be judged. It is for this very reason that their spirits return to God who gave them. They now await judgment in their spirits, and they will be judged by their spirits' response to the gospel of Christ. After having died in the flesh, they may yet choose to live according to the will of God. Well, even though it leaves this episode a little bit short, we're at a good stopping point. Next time, we will take up the end of the antediluvian age, that is, the last years up to and including the flood of Noah's day. Thank you so much for your comments. Whether you agree with me or not, I appreciate hearing from you. If I accomplish nothing more than causing someone, somewhere, to open his or her Bible and search for the truth, my efforts on the Bible and you are rewarded. I would be grateful if you would pray that the Creator God will guide me in this program and that nothing that I say will detract from His glory. All mistakes are mine, not His. Thanks for listening. And until the next time on The Bible and You, may God bless you and keep you in His will. And don't forget to study your Bible, to pray and to reach your own conclusions. Don't take my word for anything.